you've just done is illegal. And in this state, if convicted, you could be fined up to $5,000 or spend six months in a correctional facility. Oh, oh, please. No, that was dumb. I'm just, I'm just making conversation. <laughs> I'm just jerking your chin. I'll juice you up. Jim Carrey, Matthew Broderick, The Cable Guy. Hello, Jason. It's good to see you again. I ran over and killed a woman in 1986 in Ireland, and all I had to do was pay a fine. <laughs> Sorry, I was doing Matthew Broderick. I figured if you were going to do... Don't explain Jim it! Carrey, I would... Fuck them. If they don't get it, then it's on them. That was perfect. I got it. Welcome back to the Cult of Films. Uh, we are talking about the Jim Carrey vehicle that no one liked. So, what are you trying to say? Except, some people did, because it has quite a cult following. We were talking about the Cable Guy. I am John the Host. That is Jason Altz. Jason, why are we talking about the Cable Guy? Because Chris Farley died, and... Um... <laughs> couldn't play the role of the cable guy and therefore Jim Carrey did it and it wasn't as good. Yeah, it cost them half the budget to get Jim Carrey. 20 million dollars to Jim Carrey for this role. I watched a feature at Matthew Broderick was not happy <laughs> about that. I was very excited to be doing a Jim Carrey movie. I had no idea. I just knew it was called The Cable Guy and that uh, Jim was getting a lot of money. Jack Black would have been a so much better cable guy. I, I I don't know. I, I liked this. I liked his performance quite a bit. I think it was well cast because I think with that $20 million afforded to him off of the $40 million budget, it really forced Carrie to like put everything, leave everything on the court. Let's get it on. Uh, mm -hmm. There is so much in here that is from him. This was written by Judd Apatow. Because Lou Holtz Jr. wrote it, but it, he, I mean, by the time it got to Ben Stiller and Judd Apatow, it was completely rewritten. A lot of the scenes wouldn't have been there if it wasn't for Jim Carrey. The whole... Oh, the medieval times. Yeah, the whole medieval times thing. <laughs> Come back here so that I may bring thee! The brainchild of Jim Carrey. So at least he really you know contributed to the film other than just like reading lines but let's talk about our drinks that are going to help us you know sit around and wait for the cable guy there, there's nothing more boring or frustrating having to wait for the cable guy and there's also nothing so 90s because who has cable what is anymore? cable yeah <laughs> exactly i had a stretch for this one but tonight i'm drinking a uh, with another whiskey, big surprise. It's from Knob Creek. This is the smoked maple because, uh, like Jim Carrey in this film, it is sweet on the palate, but once you swallow it, 90 proofer rather. So and it'll destroy your life from the inside out. Exactly. <laughs> Just like Chip Douglas. Yeah. I couldn't really find anything in the movie that inspired me i went real basic and i just came I'm, I'm drinking a cable car oh okay which there are those in california mm -hmm. which is where this for now yeah <laughs> you know i had a perfect bet set up for to talk about this movie because before we started the cast i said you know i thought that this movie was kind of underrated and just like a little ahead of its time and that's why people didn't like it and John, you're like, well, don't give it away. We haven't started casting it. I was like, no, I used to think that. <laughs> then I rewatched it. Oh, no. So it was on the rewatch, it was just another Jim Carrey vehicle or what? I, 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 I think I was broken by watching that Netflix documentary about the making of Man on the Moon. I just, every time I watch Jim Carrey and I'm like, you don't need to do this. Angry because I love you. I'm not angry because I want to try to not give you support. Too late. Too late. All right, fine. <laughs> you don't need to pretend that acting's hard. I realize you're the first person ever to be paid twenty million dollars for in a movie. You know, like that was. Uh, but you didn't need to act like I gotta earn all twenty million, right? And that uh, Jim was getting a lot of money. You wouldn't lisp so much if you didn't chew all the scenery. But I mean, that's what was in at the time. That's what they were paying for. Why? Why cast Jim Carrey if you don't want him to be Jim Carrey in this role? Yeah, I kind of feel like Ben Stiller learned the wrong lesson from Cable Guy, maybe. Because he's like, I'm going to do a bunch of really average movies like Along Came Polly and Duplex, but I need to be in them 
because the overacting was the problem. And it's just, I don't know what this movie's problem was, but I think people saw Jim Carrey and they heard he was paid $20 million and they're like, all right, it's going to be Ace Ventura where Ace Ventura installs cable. <laughs> and this isn't Ace Ventura. No. It's Fatal Attraction. Right. Yeah. It's What About Bob? It's too dark for its own good. And that's what turned people sure. off. However, that's what I found find endearing about it. I think history has been kind to this movie. I Ultimately, I, I pooped on it a little because it's funny to be a contrarian on this show. But I do think <laughs> that people didn't know what to expect. If you watched the trailer, the trailer prepares you for the movie that you think you're going to see. Right. Cable guy! Oh, we're not friends. I don't even know you. Well, let's fix that. He's got a friend he can't control. This is a classic, everybody expects the dogs to talk in snow dogs <laughs> scenario. <laughs> where the trailer just sets it up as a different movie, and then you're like, you don't get that movie, and you're like, what the fuck was that? Mm -hmm. uh, people wanted Ace Ventura, and they were wrong to want that. History has shown that they were incorrect to want more Ace Ventura. Because when you let Jim Carrey make a dark movie, he can still do a pretty good job at it. You know, like Kick-Ass was a very dark comedy. Mm -hmm. Kick-Ass 2. He wasn't in Kick-Ass 1. Who the hell are you? We're the good guys. That was a dark comedy. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Dark comedy. So he can handle more serious, heavier stuff. And... The juxtaposition between the movie being super dark and his character's motivations being super dark and him being the same guy who puts a toilet plunger on his face, I think through people. But that juxtaposition was actually the funniest thing about the movie. Mm -hmm. It's like writing punch drunk love for Adam Sandler. Sure. Or uncut gems. This pissed people the fuck off because it didn't have that moment where you're like, Oh, okay, I am rooting for Jim Carrey now. Yes, they they give a little bit of his background of why he's a tragic character, but he only gets worse and only gets darker and only gets more unlikable, and that's what people hated. Well, they wanted Jim Carrey to be the main character. Right, right. But he wasn't. He was the prime antagonist. Mm -hmm. in, in, instead, you, you are forced to root for the straight man, and not just the straight man, because Matthew Broderick it brilliantly plays this role, but... Like, he's not a likable character either. And that's another reason why people don't didn't like this film is because mm. you can't really root for anyone. Who you, you, You're going to root for Leslie Mann, who has five minutes of screen time total? Matthew Broderick is just that stick in the mud. I just want to get this over with. So now that we have that bear off our back. Why are you doing this to me? I hate visiting my parents. Supposed to be here four hours ago. You ruined the game. We're not friends. I don't even know you. Bastard! Don't be mad. Can't you get somebody else to go? Can I pass? Come on. Steven, oh. don't be a stick in the mud. He is. He sucks. He sucks. He won't say nipple to his mother. And everyone's so bummed out by him. And that's why he secretly loves hanging around Chip Douglas. Because this guy worships his ass because no one else in his life is going to worship him. That's the thing. Every time he hangs out with Chip, he's like, I actually had a good time. Mm -hmm. I have never had a friend like this guy, right? Constantly sort of annoyed at the cable guy. I mean, I want to be with him all the time, but I'm, at the same time, I'm just like, just stop acting weird. Huh? <laughs> the stolen equipment he put in his house aside, he takes him to show him a huge satellite array so you can see how, like, the whole area gets cable television he hooks him up with all the free movie channels and he didn't even have to pay him 50 bucks you know <laughs> he throws a killer party and invites him every time he hangs out he's like i actually had a good time and it's like well shit he still acted like it was a, a major pain in the ass like he's like oh i had a great time are you gonna call me no i'm just gonna let you call me a bunch and just like upset you right and then <laughs> you know i had a great time well ghost you later mm -hmm. this is the first time that he was ever chased in his life Mm. And he liked that. He didn't care about the friendship because he probably had a pretty good relationship. Robin is played as a like a, a pretty good person, right? Like she probably put up, she was probably so nice that she put up with his shit for so long. And then finally it was just like enough. Like I, I can't deal with you anymore. 
at least we got to take a break. He was smothering her. That was the problem. She said he was smothering her. But then you look at how he treats everybody else in the movie. He doesn't have a single conversation with Jack Black's character, who's supposed to be his friend. Right. You know, he talks him like once at the beginning of the movie and then doesn't invite him to the karaoke party and then like blows him off. He's weird and distant with his parents. He like keeps everybody at arm's length, even Chip, who like is super enthusiastic about being his friend and like has fun ideas. He keeps him at arm's length just because he's weird. So to imagine him being the problem in a relationship because he's smothering mm-hmm. that that didn't play at all to me. He he's not only smothering, he's a wet blanket smothering you. Like he's just Yeah, ugh. I guess that's true. It's yeah. just like God. He's like, I just want to stay home and watch TV You're and right. just be around. <laughs> yeah. This movie is such a time capsule. It cares mm. about the main thing is so antiquated, which makes it so charming. To the point where the OJ trial was over like the year before. And mm-hmm. Ben Stiller makes that like a major background plot point, right? Like that was more like a Menendez brothers trial, I thought. I got that. Yes, very much so. It's it's just the you know what was popular at the time. Judd Apatow was just like, yeah, just throw it in. Let let's be prescient, I guess. This is a 1996 movie that referenced a 1996 movie. That was a crazy part to me when he died on the antenna. He's like, just like Goldeneye. I'm like, that came out this year. Oh, shit. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. The movie probably came out as they were filming this. That's crazy. We're introduced to Matthew Broderick. He is just out of this relationship. He's, he's getting cable set up in his house. Jack Black's character tells him uh, about the, I guess, the trope or the the urban legend that if you kick your cable guy an extra 50, he will... Uh, juice you up you know he will give you all the movie channels uh for free mm-hmm. spice channel all that stuff from the you know w- what was popping in the 90s he fucks it up so bad because he's so mean to, to, to jim carrey the entire time he pressures him into hanging out agreeing to hang out mm-hmm. in exchange for the the movie channels hey maybe i'll take you up to the satellite sometime show you how this whole thing works it's really incredible sure we should do that one day how about tomorrow Tomorrow? Tomorrow's no good. Why? What are you gonna do? Sit around and stew about your ex? No. Jack Black's like, hey, slip him 50 bucks, he'll hook you up. That's the thing everybody does. Well, Chip decides he doesn't want money, he wants to hang out, and he kind of pressures Matthew Broderick into it because he knows he's not doing anything. Because he shows up, he's like, oh, I noticed you used to live with somebody, and the cable was in your name over there, but now the cable's in her name and you're moving in here. So I got to figure your your woman kicked you out. So he gives a bunch of unsolicited advice. He like moves all the stuff in Matthew Broderick's apartment around to make the, the sound better. <laughs> Hello, mama. Is this what you want? Huh? The quality of the cable is terrible. He flips it on and just like all the channels are grainy. I'm like, oh, my God, (laughs) this was 10 generations of television ago, wasn't it? Sure. You know, he does a lot of stuff that's, you know, it's it's socially not cool. And Matthew Broderick is he just acts the same amount of uh, annoyed when. uh, Chip really oversteps his bounds, but he acts just as annoyed when the guy does something, you know, fairly innocuous. Right. You know, he's just as mad at the guy like breaking into his apartment and putting a bunch of expensive equipment there that was stolen as he was at him showing up to play basketball. (laughs) Harry couldn't dribble a basketball. They had to add the basketball in post. No, stop it. Are you serious? True story. He could not dribble. Holy shit. He's Canadian. He's so tall, though. Chip, in addition to finding fun things for them to do together, gives him advice for getting his girlfriend back. When Matthew Broderick repays this kindness by ghosting him and, you know, just being kind of shitty, not returning his phone calls. Berating him at every chance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Chip gets the message and decides to ruin his life. Why are you doing this to me? I didn't do this to you. You did this to you. You set me up. No, I taught you a lesson. I can be your best friend or your worst enemy. You seem to prefer the latter. I don't want to go into too much how kind of what happens after the film takes that turn. Sure. But it's all it's all pretty funny just because of how absurd it is. And the switch is so fast and abrupt where a lot of other movies like this 
have that gradual going up the incline and then it slowly goes down to, to the climax. Yeah. This does not. This is it's a, it's literally a montage. Right. It, it's a montage of him listening to his 16 missed voicemails. And he wasn't even home. The guy called him a bunch when he wasn't even home. <laughs> and then when he gets home and listens to his message, he's like, hey, let's hang out. Pick up, pick up, pick up. And then at the end, it's like, oh, OK, I get it. But like he was at work. Mm -hmm. As much as he was a shitty friend and like really distant and too craven to be honest with the guy, as much as all that is true. Also, you know, sociopath his character was nuts because he, right. he he called him when he was a when he was not going to be home, and then got mad that he didn't pick up. See, and he always, in my opinion, he always inserted that next level thing to, in my opinion, on purpose. Because I think he liked the... Because, okay, Chip is the em embodiment of television. So, being the embodiment of television, what is some of the, the big tropes? Well, drama, right? Uh, soap operas or just, you know, any kind of conflict. So, I think he created conflict on purpose to... Not, I, I don't think that he, he saw S Steven and he's just like, this is my guy. This is my ride or die till the end. I got you a little something. I thought you said we were even. You're breaking the rules. So shoot me. What is it? Oh, Dr. Swears. I think he was like, this is my victim because he is a sociopath for now let's ride this for a month and then on to the next as he kind of shows how fast he's able to jump into another parasitic relationship at the end of this movie am i really your buddy yeah sure you are there's probably something that it feels that something was cut out because everything just kind of went a little fast, mm -hmm. I think. But like, they're like, oh, it's explained things went fast because he's really crazy. Would we be saying the same thing about how fast things went in Fatal Attraction when that was sort of the same thing? You know, you, you ghost a person and they're like, oh, I get it. I'm going to ruin your life. Right. So maybe I'm just being sexist by it being easier to believe <laughs> Uh, a spurned woman could go nuts that fast versus a dude who presents as mentally unstable from the beginning. I'll have to think about that. Maybe I'll reassess some of my biases and be kinder to this film in the future. But <laughs> at the same time, I think things escalated very quickly. It is interesting. You think of, of psychopaths and you think of, of sociopaths. And a lot of the times they're in and out and on to the next because that is, you know, the the genesis is as equally thrilling as the conclusion, right? That and the, the rejection is a blow to their ego. Sure. It, it, but that is f further fuel to spurn them to chug along on their, you know, rampage, you know, th their path of destruction. So you you think of, I don't think a psychopath would ever try to ruin someone's life that much. Maybe like a, more of a narcissist. Okay. Because like a psychopath like sees other people as minor characters in their life. You know. So like I could see him cutting Matthew Broderick off and being like, oh, I'll go cut your cable off because you're not my friend anymore. But like doing all that stuff to try to mess his life up doesn't. It just I don't know. It doesn't seem psychopathic. It just seems. Yeah, there's, there's something else wrong with him. The the wrench in this thesis is at the karaoke night and Matthew Broderick's just like, you have really nice friends. And he's like, oh, they're not my friends. They're just, you know, preferred customers. And we all know, you know, it's revealed later that Chip does not work for the cable company any longer, but he still has access to all this equipment. So sir, he does pick and choose who he attaches himself to because a lot of those people... Uh, are you know kind of older? There, there's like the head, the like the police chief, and there's some other, I guess, kind of uninteresting people. But Stephen is the most interesting, uh, uninteresting person in the room, right? Like, I mean, you have Raul, you have the the guy from 
the warriors in there, the, the head of the, the orphans. The soothing sounds of Raul, ladies and gentlemen. You had honey in your voice tonight. So it's weird, like, who he just gives free cable to and then invites to karaoke party and then who he systematically takes down their life from the inside. You're trying to say that not one... He says that, you know, all of the knights at medieval times he get, he gives... He, he jutheth up. You're, mm-hmm. you're trying to say that those people aren't interesting? You wouldn't want to be a knight's friend? Like, I want to be a knight's friend. <laughs> why, why are you picking a, a bowl of oatmeal to be your best friend? Maybe because he negged him. So he's in for the spurn. Or he just made him work harder. Who knows? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. See, this this movie is uh, it's a little more layered and, and not even like I don't even think Judd Apatow meant it to be this layered. But it is fun to get lost in the bullshit of this movie. And, mm. and that's why it's like I would go back besides Eternal Sunshine, because I think that is my favorite Jim Carrey film. It's it's probably my top in my top five favorite films of all time. It's like Truman Show and this are the movies, the Jim Carrey movies that I actually watch now. I, it's, I'm not going back for any other shit. I'm not going back for Dumb and Dumber. I'm not going back for Ace Ventura. It's these movies. And it's not like he's doing something so different from the other roles. It's just the the rest of the package that is interesting. It's, it's drop Ace Ventura into Psycho and see what happens. And that's why this... Well, it, was, it wasn't written for him. Right. Like, we keep losing sight of the fact that this was written for and offered to Chris Farley. Sure. Who turned it down to make Black Sheep. Everyone won. <laughs> Everyone won on that, right? Can you imagine Chris Farley in this role? I, I would I, I would think it was probably forgettable. Can you imagine Norm MacDonald in this role? Just to throw that out there. As the cable guy <laughs> yeah. or as or Steven? Even as Steven. That would be great, too. Jim Carrey and Norm MacDonald? I don't know. No, I don't think Norm would put up with his shit the way Matthew Broderick did. No. <laughs> Matthew Broderick played Cameron from Ferris Bueller in this movie. Sure. Oh, my God. You're not even a real cable guy. Oh, shut up. Full circle. Full circle. Full circle. Yeah, it, it took like a Tony winning Broadway actor, no pun intended, to be able to just absorb all the bullshit that is Jim Carrey unleashed. Because this is like, you have tw- $20 million in your pocket now because we wanted to make a movie. Do something with it. And they offered Chris Farley three. Oh, you couldn't find anybody. Between Chris Farley for three million and Jim Carrey for twenty, <laughs> I don't know. It's it's hard to imagine this movie with anybody else because even yeah. somebody like Adam Sandler or Chris Farley, who would have screamed at the appropriate times, mm-hmm. I don't know. Jim Carrey just was super menacing. One thing I like that Stiller did in this movie that he likes to do in other movies, and I think people like Steven Soderbergh do this well. Almost all the minor roles are comedians. Mm. Jack Black, Andy Dick, Janine Garofalo, David Cross, you know. Bob Odenkirk. Bob Odenkirk. He packed, the, even even uh, KG had a, a cameo. It's packed full of uh, comedy people, and I, I, I really dig that he does that. Can I get a knife and fork? There were no utensils in medieval times, hence there are no utensils at medieval times. Would you like a refill on that Pepsi? There were no utensils, but there was Pepsi? Dude, I got a lot of tables. Judd Apatow met Jim Carrey like... 15 years before this, they were just both like starving stand-up comedians mm. and they stayed in touch. And then they, you know, he, he kind of put them in touch with Ben Stiller and then it kind of snowballed. How long had Jim Carrey really been? Cause like his, his debut was in living color. And that was, mm. if that was 1989, I'll be surprised. I feel like that show was 90, 91. Sure. At like yeah. the earliest. Mm-hmm. So this was pretty early into Jim Carrey's career. So he made like three movies and he's like, I think I should be paid $20 million. That's insane. Which was crazy because like for this to be the movie that actors decided they were worth $20 million, you know, for this to be the movie <laughs> is crazy to me. <laughs> you would think he would have had to have done a good job. Some would say this guy. Whether I do a good job or not, I still get two mil. Right. Only it's 20, and it's everybody. It's Chris Pratt. He was not... Okay, Jim Carrey... Jim Carrey demanded $20 million so that Chris Pratt could have more money than <laughs> talent. Yeah. 
would you say that Jim Carrey was nineteen million dollars more important to this movie than Matthew Broderick? <laughs> Matthew Broderick got a million. <laughs> Probably not. Jim Carrey got like $3 million for Dumb and Dumber and Jeff Daniels got like $10,000 in like some Stucky's coupons. Like it was ridiculous how much more Jim Carrey gets paid than like the straight man that has to hold a movie together while Jim Carrey goes off script. Oh, okay, but think of think of it this way. Nowadays, or, or like 2006 through now, you want Bruce Willis in your film? It's going to cost you at least five million. Five million to start the conversation. Another three mm-hmm. to get him in the door, right? And every single thing since like 2006, Bruce Willis has phoned in a hundred percent. That's not debatable. Mm-hmm. How about you be motherfucker? Jim Carrey at least took this by the balls and turned it into something. You know, it's it's not the best movie ever, and, and and a lot of people didn't like it, but it is the best movie it could have been within the, the parameters, right? Like, at least he did something with this. He didn't just, like, unabashedly cash his check and said, when do I start? W- when do I walk on? When's, what's my line? Okay, here it is. I'm going back to my trailer. He was sword training. He was doing the Spock thing. You know, he was down and dirty with this film. Never let it alone until it's, you know, until somebody checks the gate, you know. It paid dividends for him because this was sure. this was the jumping off point, like you said earlier, where he was able to take on those more serious roles. Counterpoint, yeah. counterpoint. Yeah, go ahead. Acting's easy. Oh, sh- not here. I'll let you Jim do that Carey, anywhere Jim else. Jim Carrey can do it. Not here. Jim Carrey. You just, you tell, <sighs> hey, am I going to chew the scenery? No, you're not going to chew the scenery. You're going to be a little bit sad. Oh, okay. I can do that because anyone can play make-believe. Oh, my God. I'd like my $20 million now. He's Jim Carrey sad in this, though. Do you want to be sad? <laughs> ben Stiller was 30 when he directed this movie. I know. Oh, my God. I'm a fucking failure. I've done nothing with my life. Nothing. Zero. I'm a piece of shit. Ben Stiller. Now, if Ben Stiller had waited until he was 38, it would have made me feel better. And also, <laughs> also the movie might have been with different people. I don't know. You're not even 38. I know that because you're bet. younger than me. This movie was eight years ahead of its time. So if Ben Stiller had just waited an appropriate amount of time, if he'd wait till he was 40, put this movie on 2006, and it would have been, you know, the the AT&T guy or, or whatever. <laughs> Yeah. Cable modem guy. I think people might have gotten it. I think this was a little too dark and cynical for the mid 90s when everyone thought that Friends was the funniest show in yeah. ever and that the, the party would last for all time. This shit would kill now. Well, every comedy made now is cable guy. All right. Everything is game night. It can't just be funny. It's got to have really high, incredibly high stakes. It's got to have action movie stakes in a comedy to yeah. get made now. Yeah. It's got to be an MCU film. Yeah. Now. Or, yeah. Yeah. It's Venom now. Like, that is your comedy. Yeah. Yeah, I say either. I say neither. And I say neither. So it's not just that, like, this movie would do better now. But this movie is all movies. Judd Apatow realized what of this movie worked and what didn't. And then Judd Apatow... When became Judd Apatow. Mm -hmm. And that was all we got for 15 years. You got Adam McKay or Judd Apatow or sometimes both. Can I just say how dynamically shot this film is? Robert Brinkman is credited as the cinematographer. But if you go and watch the featurette uh, about Cable Guy... That was like an HBO exclusive back in the day. They used to do that a lot. Like it it was pre YouTube. If you wanted to know like the BTS on films back in the day, you tune into HBO at like seven o'clock and and whatever the, the, the new hotness was that was coming out, it would be on HBO. Hi, HBO first look. We're here for the making of the cable guy. I I thought Ben canceled that. Okay, just just know he, he he's tired. He's like a little edged out. He's because he's been working hard. He actually was really good behind the camera. Like Ben Stiller has a fucking great eye for filmmaking. He is such a great 
director, yeah, he's a good scene composer. I guess he has good scene composition. This this movie, it's a long winded way of saying this movie looks really good. There's horror elements to it that are shot really well, like a competent horror movie. It's kind of creepy. I, I'm I, I'm not gonna lie. I had a nightmare of a of a contact lens Jim Carrey chasing me through an endless hallway when I was a kid when I watched this film. Somebody told Ben Stiller what a Dutch angle was five minutes before they started shooting. <laughs> and he impressed you. He did. He got there. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not. I'm just being a dick now. Like, I, I, I think you're 100% right about how he used a very, very basic techniques to make this seem creepy. It's like in film school and they make you recut a trailer for a movie mm -hmm. to be a different genre. Yeah. You know, like they recut Dumb and Dumber to be a horror movie. This is like Dumb and Dumber cut to be a horror movie. Only this movie made half of its budget back on its opening weekend. So maybe like the broke take is this movie was ahead of its time and everyone mm -hmm. hated it. And maybe the woke take is like, I think we remember this movie as not being as successful because nobody talked about it around a water cooler because it didn't have Jim Carrey like talking about his balls or whatever. It wasn't Ace Ventura 3. So everyone just assumed it sucked, but like it turns out this movie made a hundred million dollars. It made half its money back in two days. Did people really hate it? Yes, but it that's how powerful Jim Carrey's magnetism was back in the nineties. He would get butts and seats. That's why you gave him twenty million dollars, cause because because you could make twenty million dollars the opening exactly, weekend. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh this is also the best Kyle Glass performance I've ever seen. As the couch potato. It's not the best Jack Black performance I've ever seen. That belongs to the movie The Jackal, where he got his arm blown off. <laughs> and Owen Wilson was literally... Uh, the same age he is now in this. What's the story with our chicken, man? Your chicken. Have the eggs had a chance to hatch yet? Well, maybe you can go check on it for me, my friend, if it's not too much trouble for you. All right, I'm sorry to put you out. Can you see the attitude? It, it's Owen Wilson is that, you know, he's not the sexiest man alive like Paul Rudd, but he is ageless, and he fucking Owen Wilson has always been 32 years old. So do you want to know what was at the box office the weekend this movie came out? No, but I would love for you to tell the audience, Jason. It wasn't up against much. The Rock, Gwyn Gwyneth Paltrow's Emma, uh, Billy Zane's The Phantom. <laughs> you said nothing. Uh, was out around that, you know, around that weekend. Eraser, Hunchback of Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. uh, Independence Day was Independence Day 96. So like, you know, but The Nutty Professor, uh, I guess Striptease was kind of a comedy. But for the most part, it was uh, shit like Dolph Lundgren's Silent Trigger. There just wasn't a ton at the box office. Maybe that explains part of the $20 million opening weekend when it was up against Storybook Ooh. and, you know, Bounty Hunters. There was a Wallace and Gromit movie probably. <laughs> so This is a movie that made a ton of money because of the name that was attached to it that everyone hated because it was dark that launched the careers, which is so funny. It launched the, like the second career of Jim Carrey. Let's say this was a bad movie. It won a kid's choice award. <laughs> it cleaned up at the MTV movie awards. I saw that. Best best. They have best villain at the MTV movie awards. Jesus. But it also won the, it was also nominated for Most Painfully Unfunny Comedy at the Stinkers Bad Movie Awards, so. <laughs> Fuck them. Was this a funny movie, John? Uh, it's not traditionally funny. However, it's funny, it, it, it's so infused with dry comedy, it's funny in the way that Mystery Men is, is funny. So if you... Mystery Men had quotable dialogue. Can you quote a line from this movie that isn't... Chip Douglas quoting a line from a Quote different a movie. line from this. Or were all the, or were all the gags in Cable Guy just him referencing another movie or TV quote show? Quote a line from the, Jason, this, I could quote an entire song from this movie. 
Jim Carrey's unhinged rendition of Somebody to Love is the biggest earworm on the face of the planet. I can't pretend that that karaoke scene didn't make the film. They were in awe of him because they're just like, eh, how do you feel about this? And he had like a choreographed dance like done that they wanted him to do. And on shooting day, he's just like, fuck it. Let me just do this. I can't dribble a basketball. What makes you think I could do a choreographed dance? And then he just laid on his back. That. And it just made the movie. Twenty million dollars, way too much. However, he, however, however, what if he didn't get twenty million dollars for this? What if he accepted three million dollars for this, and then nobody ever got twenty million? No, because somebody else would have gotten. Who would who would have been the first person to get twenty million dollars for a movie, <laughs> if not Jip Carrey? I, I don't think it would have been. It would have been Will Smith, right? Yeah. For Wild Wild West. It wouldn't have been different because I don't think he could do it any other way. And that's what puts him above. And that's what, ladies and gentlemen, put it here first. F. Jason Alt's thesis on acting is easy because there is only one Jim Carrey. And he can only do it one way. Jim Carrey (laughs) is more than enough. Jason, where can everyone find you? Uh, In your apartment. Whether you want me there or not. <laughs> hey, look, I broke in while you were at work. That's funny, right? <laughs> that's what that's what comedies are. Hey. He's there to juice you up. When a guy tries to make you say the word clitoris to your mother. You know, hijinks. No, I won't do it. I'm not going to do it. I don't want to play it. anymore. I've had enough. That's it. It's just skin, Stevens. I don't know why I'm pretending I like this movie less than I did. I'm like a <laughs> 7 out of 10 on this movie. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> just trying to make this not us agreeing with each right. other. And the more you say that you like this movie, the more I'm like, mm, it's pretty good. <laughs> this movie's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's a dark comedy It got pooped on a little bit because it was ahead of its time. And then you look and it made two and a half times its budget back. And you're like, oh, well, shut up. I don't want to hear complaining (laughs) when you paid Jim Carrey $20 million, but made a hundred, you know? So this was ahead of its time. I think if Jim Carrey had done more serious stuff or Adam Sandler had played the cable guy, you know, I I think people would have had different expectations, certainly. And I, I think it... People wouldn't have been like, well, I, exp- I wanted a comedy and this wasn't funny because it's 1996. And I think comedy is uh, when people think a straight guy is gay. There's nothing funnier than that. <laughs> Let's make 40 movies about how like someone's a straight guy, but people think he's gay. And he goes, oh, no, they think I'm gay because that was the height of comedy in 1996. So um, Jim Carrey talking about his balls was actually refreshing at the time. So people kind of expected uh ace ventura didn't get it but what they got was a very very good dark comedy that was a the genesis for everything judd apatow did and b the genesis for all like the really like comedy of error shit that ben stiller did both as an actor and as a director afterward right because i feel like this movie informed how ben stiller acted He acted like the Matthew Broderick character and like society's rules were the Jim Carrey character in basically every movie Ben Stiller did after this. The antagonist in Meet the Parents is just like someone who doesn't like him. So, (laughs) yeah, right. Yeah. Someone who's not utterly charmed by him is the main antagonist. That was his do over for Cable Guy. (laughs) hmm. That's yeah. So I, I think as much as you know this movie i kind of expected to like it more upon rewatching because like i feel like people were unfair to it back in 1996 i feel like this informed a lot of what came after not just actor salaries but also kind of how people approached dark comedy so this movie is very influential and important and uh you can watch it if you want it holds up okay it does it transcends the are you going to like Jim Carrey? Of course, you know, like those people probably will. But for <laughs> how cool would it be to be that person where the cable guy is your introduction to Jim Carrey? 
Like, I am so close to showing my son, who's 13 years old, the cable guy first. He has no idea who Jim Carrey is. First? First. He doesn't. I will admit I saw Ace Ventura too young to see Ace Ventura. But, I, I mean, Ace Ventura came out at a perfect time in, in, in both of our ages where, I, at least myself. No, dude, I was 10. Yeah, the same. But I, I, I idolized him. You don't him. show a 10-year-old Ace Ventura. I idolized him at that point. And I'm just like, this is who I want to be. Or that was my idol. I was just like, this guy is different. This guy gets it. At 10 years old, I'm like, I have to be like this person. Or at least, like, th this is the person that's showing me the way. How, with all that said, all that shit that came out that was just vomited out studio wise, this is the thing that I'm just like, hey, you're smart enough to get this. <laughs> like, this is just so on a different level from all the other noise. You should probably start here. And, and I'm putting it on yeah. a on a definitely you're smart enough to get. I don't care who you are, or how old you are. You are smart enough. Exactly. To get this. Exactly. It, it, it's it's kind of conflated on a pedestal. I know. Uh, I, I tend to be a little hyperbolic. Uh, welcome to the cult of films. However, I just hold Jim Carrey in this like special place in my cold, dead heart. And uh, for whatever reason, he just was popular at the time that I cared. Jason Alts, where can everyone find you, sir? I'm on Twitter at me, myself, and I rate. <laughs> Jason E. Allen on Twitter. Even I don't know how I felt about this movie. Jesus. On Twitter, at John the Host. You could like this video. You could share it with your friends. Tell everyone we're talking about cult films and the cable guy because, you know, something that made, like, triple its budget. Eh, is it a cult film? Is it not? Yell at me in the comments. Tell me I'm wrong. This concludes our broadcast day. Click. <laughs>